by showing you this picture. This is a sculpture. It's in the eye of a needle, a real size sewing needle. And it's a picture of the earth and some of the solar, you know, solar system. And in order to do this, they use some really special techniques. Um, and so we're gonna mostly talk about tools and techniques for testing small projects and some of the strange issues you face from going from you know what you think is a normal project to multiple small projects. I currently work at a company called Silicon Publishing. We have employees in Buenos, Buenos Aires, Prague, Seattle, San Francisco, and one other place that I can't quite remember right now. Um, we meet on Skype every day. We're definitely an agile team. We meet in person sometimes. And if we hadn't met in person first, I don't know that this kind of remote agile team would be possible. Um, but we do remote agile development and testing every day. I say I'm our director of quality because I do our quality planning. I'm the first tester in this company. We now have two. And um, we, yeah, so <laughs> it, it, there's not a lot of directing, you'd think. Except for, I also coordinate integration testing and quality with every one of our clients and their testing department. So some of our clients um, are really small businesses with 20 people. We've also worked with Hallmark and Shutterfly and Amazon, which are really large companies with big testing teams. And we have uh, usually between four and 10 projects going at a time. So there's a lot of projects. The shortest project I've been in was 10 days. The longest project, in, I can't really say it's been one release because we do consistent releases and the whole time I've been there since 2012, we've been working with this client. So it's an ongoing multiple release partnership. Um, but we don't have any projects that are planned that last more than nine months. So that's why you get two weeks to nine months. That's the scope I'm hoping to cover for you guys. Um, so welcome to the world of small testing. You see this little gnome. Um, the, in Washington State, where I live, by Mount Rainier, there's a tiny gnome village you can go visit, and it's set up. It's really hilarious. So if you ever come out to visit me, I live kind of by Mount Rainier, and they have a little trail with a gnome village set up, all kinds of small stuff. So um, this is what we're going to, well, I hope we're going to talk, and it's, now everyone's caffeinated. And if the way I speak, if you've seen it before, there's going to be a picture and I'm going to tell you a story. So if you have a burning topic, a question or a story that goes with that picture, you just, just raise your hand and we're going to go for the gusto. But if it's not related to that picture, then um, we'll have a little bit of time at the end, But so hopefully. Uh, so we're going to talk about first what I mean by small. I'm going to go into more detail than just time frame. Um, treating small projects as change, so testing the changes and not necessarily every single thing. Um, first, I'm going to start with the three to nine month projects, which I think is a typical Agile project now. I used to think that was small. I worked for 10 years at Adobe. When I started, I worked on Adobe InDesign early versions. By the time I left, I was um, leading testing across the creative suites up through CS55 at Adobe. So what I thought of a project, I thought of one year for a dot release up to two years for a creative suite. A really complicated, a lot of upfront development. We had agile teams, but none of them actually released anything to a customer before two years or one year if it was a dot release. So maybe we use some agile processes, but if you don't ever release to a customer, you're playing the agile game, but you're not getting any feedback. So you're trying to be agile, but you're limited in the feedback you get. So it's a little bit different. Um, we still, as agile as possible, some of the teams there. We'll talk about nine to 12 weeks, five to eight, two to four, less than two weeks. The craziest project I've ever been on, 10 days in length. And it's really fun and really bizarre. And then hopefully, um, some questions from you guys about the terminology, anything. So first, what do I mean by small? 
I have a few animal specimens here that are pretty interesting. This is radar. It's a Belgian horse. It is the tallest and largest living horse today. Horses are measured by hands. This horse is 19.5 hands high. It says in Wikipedia, Belgian horses get up to 17 feet high. So this one is over the possibilities. <laughs> Definitely an edge case. On the right, this is not just a miniature horse, Thumbelina. This miniature horse is also a dwarf miniature horse. And that horse, let me take a look here. 17 inches in height, so smaller than a dog in, in height. So this horse here, um, 60 pounds of food and 20 plus gallons of water per day. This one, far less. So we're talking about what kind of resources, expenditure, output, planning is required, right? It has to be appropriate for what we're talking about. So we can't just say, and I know my American accent, I say a project, not a project, but you know what I mean, hopefully. Okay, so um, I wanted to start by talking about the nine month projects. Usually a nine month project is a year long project that someone's cheaping out on. It's not a nine month project. <laughs> it's just crazy. They're like, well, this took a year last time and because I want to and we're agile now, it's going to fit into 12 months because I'm just going to lock the door and shove pizzas under there and the programmers are going to go and it's just going to be great. Um, so I've seen a lot of this. The main question to ask up front is, why do we think it's going to take nine months and how will we know when it fails? So learning how to have an effective conversation about the time estimate is extremely important. Uh, really interesting thing about assumptions, when I first started in my current role, went out to see this customer in Wisconsin. Super cold, really enthusiastic people, went in there and they showed me a video. And they said, in six months, we were gonna build Adobe InDesign on the web. And I just thought, okay, I was on that team. It took five years, a uh, hundred developers, uh, several hundred people for the first version. Now they're on version eight. Five years, that people, you really think, you know, these 15 guys and me are gonna do that in six months. But you can't say that. Um, so we got through their, this huge list of everything it was gonna do. And they asked me, they said, well, what would you feel comfortable what kind of time frame would you feel comfortable committing to on this list? And me being new and not very bright about meeting with clients yet, I said never, realistically never. And uh, that was horrible because it did not, it was not an open-ended question, it was not constructive, it was not instructive, and it was not helpful. It was negative, it was not understanding, and if they asked me that question today, I would say instead, what can we, what kind of experience are you hoping to create that we can realistically do in this time frame? Let me explain what it took to make InDesign being more involved with it. It might not be obvious. And let's talk about what we can do. Because just saying you're not going to help someone or even tell them, you know, just saying no is really uh, harmful to business relationships. So let's just say I haven't been to Wisconsin. The project went on for a while. It did not succeed. It cost people money. And, and I, I said my measure of success is the clients make money because if they don't make money, they're not happy. And that's not the only measure of quality for me, but it's very, very important in the context that we work in because we are serving the clients. And if they don't have software that helps people, if our clients don't earn money, they're not in business and we have let them down. So it's really important for us. Okay, so talking about change, one of the ways that we keep things small and agile, from my perspective, is testing around the changes in the code. And that may be feature changes in the story, it might be changes in platforms or browsers or devices we're now supporting, 
or it could also be changes in terms of our customers that we're now serving. We might be branching out. So trying to define that and cover it effectively is where I put a lot of time if the projects are three to nine months. So if it's three to nine months, I have time to talk to that client, figure out what are the most important things, and do a little bit of research so that we have an idea what we're testing for, what we're developing for, some context for the project. And that usually is something I try to do at the very beginning of a sprint when most of what the testing that's going on is me making sure things are testable, that I have testing tools and environments set up, and that developers have acceptance criteria that they need for development. Um, I've heard a lot of people that say in their agile sprints they have a little bit of an issue because the developers are heads down in the code and they're, they don't have much to do, but the last day of the sprint, everyone checks everything in and they're running around like a chicken with their head cut off and they can't do anything. Um, but the way I see it, that time at the beginning is your time to research, prepare, get your test files, get your tools set up, have your environments. You should already know if you need a matrix to cover certain things, you've got your test charters. There's a lot to do in that time. You're trying to make sure up front things are testable. If we have a service that needs to be uh, ready to go, we're at least going to test the hello world comes through our tool if we're not going to have an interface. So we have to do all of our planning in that time for those stories to come and all of our setup, as well as help our developers and ourselves really understand the context of those changes. Um, I looked again, every year I read the version one uh, survey of Agile practices. If you've ever looked at that, it's a whole bunch of charts and analytics of how people have answered what they're looking for out of Agile. Every year, it seems a trend to me that people switch to Agile because they want everything faster. Overwhelmingly, that's not what they get. Overwhelmingly, they get more understanding about why it's not faster and more control over what they cut. So there's a conversation that needs to happen here. Those of us who have the visibility and the feet on the ground should be having the conversation earlier that there is this trend that, that Agile doesn't make you necessarily instantly faster, but what it can do is it can help you prioritize and it can give you visibility into what's holding you back from going faster and with time. It can help our team make the improvement together to make us deliver the right thing with higher quality. So um, this is my favorite. See, this is the first, uh, well, wait, no, it's the fourth animal picture. I'm already behind in my metrics. So this is a snail riding a turtle, which is one of my dorkiest favorite jokes as a kid, which is, what does a snail say when riding on a turtle? It says, wee. <laughs> <laughs> so um, to the snail, it's going faster than ever before. And the turtle says, not for me, this sucks. Right? The turtle's now supposed to go faster, and it's carrying another creature on its back. So I feel like the developers are kind of the turtle in the Agile world, and the CEOs are like on the top of the bullwhip, like, woohoo, we're going to go faster. We're just going to lock the developers in. It's going to be great. Um, and then they burn out their employees, and nobody's motivated, and it becomes Agile's fault. Uh, why is Agile abusing the developers? Developers are saying, well, this Agile's terrible. You know, people are just abusing us and treating us like we're not humans, and not calling us resources is really going to help, yeah. Um, so it's kind of not been great. There's some negativity about some of the processes and tools that can really foster communication if they're used right. Part of that is using our experience that we've had to not repeat past patterns. So like me not telling a customer these requirements are never going to happen in six months. Instead, using that to start a better conversation of if six months is the hard deadline, what could we realistically do? And how are we going to measure that? And what are we going to base it on? And how are we going to get feedback from the client that that's how we want it to be? Uh, yeah, this is about how we go faster. So we have velociraptors. And then you're going to give them some fancy tools, some rocket grenade propelled on sharks with freaking laser beams. 
So yeah, um, they buy a lot of tools sometimes, and there's this idea that we can automate 100% of the code coverage, and then there won't be any bugs. I don't know if like it's by osmosis that things start to work together, but um, some of the ideas get kind of crazy that people use. Um, unproven, really unscientific, and not well thought through strategies. I mean, the whole idea between Agile is you start simple, you test some things out, and you use what works. Not you climb on a shark, go off with your, you know, with no safety precautions, and fail gloriously. So um, I think there's less of that happening now than there were in the early days. With small tools, um, something that you think is insane could be sane to someone else. When I first started some of the projects, I didn't think it was possible we could ever deliver anything in 10 days. I thought that was totally crazy. Um, and having seven projects at once, I thought, okay, so they're just not going to do any testing. That's my guess. They're going to tell me the one project that I need to work on, and that'll be fine. One of the ways we've been able to focus on change in our longer projects is using Jenkins, which I also am a Jenkins administrator, and I learned some crazy stuff, like a few Unix things, how to set up timing, tickets. If you want to do short projects, you have to be a jack of all trades. So that means I may pull out a manual for a tool and learn how to make it work, because there's one other developer who knows it really well, but I'm his backup. So uh, sometimes we need to learn tools like really quickly in order to make things happen. So we've started Jenkins with a couple jobs. Now we have it to where I can go in and test any build separately with the change, except to reject it and get it made into a master build with everything else. And if I couldn't test each change individually, I went through and just kind of tried to guesstimate how many bugs are prevented that way. Um, I would say one out of three fixes I look at, I find several things that we need to revise before we integrate it. So a lot. I cannot tell you how many bugs I prevented, but far more than I could catch in the amount of time I have to get something out in three to nine months. So being able to test the fixes in isolation is the number one way that we ever have a project go out in nine months or less. And if you don't have continuous integration now, try to move toward it. Um, you can just get more builds that are stable. You can just automate your sanity test. We started out with no automation. Um, code was still being emailed in some cases. And now we have continuous integration in a few months. So it's, um, the tools are really good. And there's people who are friendly, who know them, there's free books. I've been really surprised at how many tools are free or close to free that have helped us. Uh, also, I cannot be the single point of testing. There's a lot of developers, um, myself and this other guy named Matt, who knows a ton about the workflow. We're all the testers for the company. So if I go on vacation and there's seven projects, and Matt's not available, a developer is going to have to make a decision. How risky is this? So our process is flexible. It has to be, depending on the project. So if the project must go out, and not integrating this fix is going to make the schedule slip, then it's possible at that point the client would prefer to have their team do the testing, or have the build delivered and test it on their side before everything's looked at. That kind of flexibility is a business choice um, and not always my choice. I'll make a recommendation based on where we are. So the only secret I know to go faster is the KISS acronym, which means uh, keep it simple squirrels. <laughs> I think it means that. Um, and plus, I really like the picture because I think the squirrels are kind of cute. Um, Scope creep is a huge problem, especially in anything over six months. So knowing your stories, where they are, if they're growing, are we taking something out? That kind of thing is important. And then also doing uh, your sprint reviews. When we first started, when I first started working at the company, sprint reviews were not something 
uh, regular, you could say. They would happen if something went wrong. The point of doing your sprint review is to prevent things from going wrong. I had a great talk um, before I started speaking today. It's my first conference that I've been able to go speak at for a year. Because I had a problem, a medical issue that's been totally solved. And I just said, I will never stop. I will never skip a physical again. I could have saved myself six months of pain and agony by having my blood work done on time. I think having your sprint reviews and retrospectives can be the same sort of thing. They may not be that helpful every time, but the time you skip them when it is important, wow, that can be costly. So part of keeping your process working, part of keeping your tools up to date, and part of keeping things as simple as they can be is having regular checkups and conversations so you can address problems. So um, to me, the standard agile tools apply for projects three to nine months. That is the new normal. I don't think that's special. If you're having a problem delivering in that time, it's probably because the normal things we already know to do for Agile aren't in place, aren't being done yet, or you simply are having trouble keeping it simple, keeping the scope under control, or possibly your business conversations aren't going well. So if, if, if six to nine months um, is not enough to deliver a project, there's analytics that can help, but I'm pretty sure everyone in the company knows why. It's usually not a secret. Um, however, 9 to 12 weeks is, uh, I think, a little bit easier than trying to take a one-year project and making it go into nine months. Because nobody thinks you can do a full-scale project that's huge in that amount of time. Plus, you can break it into segments like uh, how many sprints is it? And you, you have some checkpoints for where you want to be at that time. But it's going to be a wild ride. That's why I used a, a baby fawn. You are really vulnerable in this space, um, especially when you start. You need to make sure up front, in, if you're doing a 9 to 12 week project, that you're not going to be blocked. So something really simple like not having a server set up or not your integration not working or delaying testing by a few weeks can throw the whole project off the rails. The newer the project is, the more critical it is that you aren't blocked. You absolutely have to get off to a good start and you have to be very vigilant in the first one third of the project. Uh, what I've learned is we can tell really quick what's going to happen with the project of this length. If it's going to make it, we will be one third of the way there one third of the time done. And if we're not, corrective action needs to happen then. So um, the Agile tools, especially Pivotal Tracker is one tool we use. I love that tool. Um, any tool you use, now we need that because we are a distributed team, not in one location. That tool is basically a, a Kanban board, swim lanes, online. We have to have it to where everyone can use it because we're not in one location. Now, if you have your sticky notes up there and you can all see it, great. Um, that didn't work for us because we're just not in one place. And we all are on Skype all day, so we're still talking uh, amongst each other. The, uh, yeah, Pivotal Tracker will tell us how the stories are going, what percentage of them are passing, without us doing a lot of work. So that's what's helpful. The five to eight week projects um, are really cute because you're talking about one to two months. Super small, you're gonna be able to look at those stories easily, assign them out, you can kind of tell what the tasks are. I notice in Agile uh, training a lot of times you have a project that's really small. So it'll look familiar if you've taken training because you never see a big project, you couldn't possibly get that in a training course. But then what happens is all of a sudden your project's out of control. Um, it's just like a crazy kitten and all the furniture is destroyed. So um, keeping a close eye on it, 
But another thing for us is being very clear about the bugs. What is it that's happening? We don't have time to go back and forth on those. So we use Jing or Snagit, which they're free recording tools. I found in working remote that, and working with clients, a video is worth any number of words. A video is, works from multiple lo, uh, locations, it works from multiple languages, it works for people who do things differently. I remember so many times I've sent a bug to somebody that I believe the steps are perfect and they can't reproduce it. They're unknowingly waiting for everything to finish in a race condition <laughs> or they are um, going through a different path that they know works because in their mind that's how you do that thing. And, and maybe they read my words to tell them, click here, go to this area. And they, in their mind, they say, oh, I know another way. I used the keyboard shortcut. That worked. So a lot of times the confusion is just this unintentional gap between them reading and acting. And part of it is memory related, too. It's, uh, I've learned that you can never assume somebody is intentionally not reproducing a bug. Nobody would do that on purpose. So a lot of times, if you think you're communicating clearly, and they think they're reading and performing it clearly, it can be, if the video doesn't work, the next thing our team does is they will say, can we get on video conference and can I watch you do that while we're on the phone? So what are you gonna do if they, if the bug happens every time for you and not for them? It can just be the magic of the developer's machine. Um, they think there's magic in my machine, and I kind of have the belief there may be some magic in their machine to make these things more or less likely to happen. One hilarious thing, um, I wrote down that word. She used uh, cod swab. <laughs> so when I typed that in, my spell check recommended code wallop. <laughs> I thought, how perfect for a testing conference. So yeah, um, if you're faced with any, <laughs> any cod swallow, you should definitely go wallop the code. Give it a test. <laughs> so uh, yeah, less uh, listening and words, more watching, interaction, and doing is what's going to make a short project happen. Um, there's an element that's really hard for me to describe to uh, other people of testing where you refuse to be blocked. I ran into a situation this uh, weekend. I helped my sister move. She had this king size bed with a huge headboard and it had been moved so many times. I mean, it just, um, we got to this point where we could not get these screws out. And uh, her husband, my brother-in-law's this construction working guy. He's got his power tools in there. just could not get the screws out. And they took off and I said, okay, I'm gonna fix this problem. I went in there with a flashlight, found out they had been using a Phillips five head screwdriver on a four point square <laughs> bolt. And they were seriously, the yay long. And uh, so someone went and bought, a, a few of them were stripped beyond belief. Well, we found a screwdriver, got most of them out. There's one that's totally stripped. I mean, the whole, it just, nothing left. Someone brought a device that you drill a hole and you pull out the screw and I get half the things out and one person helping me says, you can't undo the rest of those screws. The headboard's going to fall on you. It's a terrible idea. Step back here. You're about to get injured. And I said, I don't want to get injured here. Let's get some people. And, um, well, I got some other people to stand in there. We tried the tool to get the last one out, and it wasn't long enough. So they're counting on us. The truck's by the hour. They got to have a bed to sleep on tonight. We tried the tool. We tried the drill. Just, I'm like, well, what if we take the drill bit and we just drill holes all the way around that thing like the cartoon with the coyote, and he gets the saw, on and the, the woodpecker comes out of the ceiling and runs away, you know, like that? No, nobody liked that idea. So we got a crowbar. We got between the two. And the side that had the wood that wasn't that important and wasn't visible, we pried that thing out to the best of our ability. And 
asked the guy to bring a sawzall in, and we sawed through that last one. Long story short, we lost one screw worth 10 cents. The bed survived. Everyone, no one was injured. There was minor bruises. I mean, to be fair, my grip strength is still not good uh, after trying to take those stripped screws out. But the good news is we were not blocked. There were four points where different people gave up. You have to have one person who's stubborn. If you are not a stubborn tester, you cannot work on short projects effectively. And I don't mean stubborn, like rude to people, ridiculous. I mean persistent. I mean willing to work around and try seven things. If thing one doesn't work, what next? Who else are you going to ask? Who, who has expertise that you don't have? Uh, one thing I've noticed about security, I know two things about security, and they're the most important things. I know how to look for the basics, and I know when I'm out of my realm. That's all you need to know. How are you going to test for the basics and consider it? And how do you know when you need someone else? Those are the two most important things, I think, in getting a short project out. That's it. And also, just having the will to continue and knowing the cost if you don't. Sometimes, who picked five to eight weeks? Does it really need to be eight weeks, or is 10 weeks OK? Well, in our case, uh, we have this one client that they make yearbook software. If the kids graduate and they don't have their rings and they don't have their yearbook, that's a big issue, really big issue. Okay, my favorite, the cutest of all, is a real freak of nature, two to four weeks. Tiniest of all monkeys, size of a finger, I think is very cute. I don't even know what kind of monkey that is, except a really weird and very cute small one. So the projects we've had, the two to four weeks, are easy because they don't last very long and they're painful, but then they're over. Kind of like me with this bed, right? You either have victory or you have defeat and you have it soon. But I don't think you can always work the way that it takes to get something out in under two weeks. What you're doing in under two weeks is you're putting a beautiful surface on something existing. This cake, tiny cake, is an Oreo with some cool whip on it, right? So the Oreo existed. Nobody baked this cake. You're not gonna bake a cake from scratch in less than two weeks. What you're gonna do is you're gonna put a beautiful wrapping on your existing thing and make it look beautiful and give it a test run in less than two weeks. We have a plugin. It's based on known architecture that we made in two weeks. It's someone else's core work. <coughs> It had two key things that it had to be able to do. We did this project in 10 days. There was another team from another company who'd worked on it for six months. And ours met the requirements, and the other companies did not. The reason why is we didn't build something from scratch. There was already something free that existed. We made it look how they needed it to look plugged it into their existing architecture, and used all their development and testing work that was already there. So if you've got to do something small, you just really can't, you can't recreate the wheel. Um, there's a couple other things I'll show you that are small. I have never worked on anything under two weeks that was a real project that needed new architecture from start to finish. It wasn't something that had been done before that actually happened. Um, so someone suggests it. It's good to see what else has been done like that, and if it's possible. I know that a lot of projects do happen that are that small, but usually there's something the team does all the time. And so it's really a, just a change on something existing more than a totally brand new item. I think that's part of what Janet was talking about, too, when she was talking about having a release built on another release with no important defects. She says zero defects. There's always some kind of defect, and I would say no blocking issues, no uh, value harming defects. <laughs> so it, it can be real tricky. I'm not sure if I'm using the exact perfect words there. So I haven't personally worked on something smaller than weeks except for things like documentation or a one-off bug fix. And um, that kind of thing is more about validation and communication than it is about 
actual software development. So I don't think that the agile process even applies as much with that. Um, that's just a portion of a project. I don't consider it a release. If it's just one fix to a customer, that's like doing one story, not one project. So I didn't really fit that in. But I wanted to tell you a few stories that were really remarkable to me that I found when learning about small things. The first thing is, there's a contest in Japan where each person will have a set of pencils and you have to keep the lead intact in the pencil. And then they judge the artwork and it is so amazing the precision that they're able to achieve with some of these pencils. Um, so I took, a, I took a look at the website. I have a reference in a bit if you want to look at more of them. But I thought it's pretty amazing how elegant the wrapping is on something as simple as a pencil. I think it's just amazing. So, you know, just because you may not build something from scratch, you can still really do something transformative, important, and amazing with an existing object or existing piece of software that's never been seen before. I think that we see websites that are innovative, but not necessarily brand new all the time. This thing right here is a brass version of the Lord's Prayer on the head of a pin. And the reason I wanted to show you this one is it's the first one. And it was built in 1902 out of brass. It's a two millimeter pin, the head of the pin is two millimeters across by a guy named Paul Wentz. Now what happened was after that came out, it got popular. The World's Fair was coming up. There's a gentleman by the name of Gottfried Lundberg who lived in the Seattle area, sometimes in Spokane, by where I live at. And he saw this and said, you know what, I'm an engraver. I can do better than this. Two millimeters, that's nothing. I'm gonna, so he got a gold head of a pin and from the years of 1913 to 1915, he trained himself. He went off of all caffeine, he stopped, <laughs> he's just water, vegetables, he built a special chair, strapped himself into a chair, a barber's chair, with leather on his wrists. He trained around his heartbeat and designed a custom whole needle in, on top of this chair, used 2,814 gold pins to get one Lord's Prayer on half the size. So he accomplished this by working around his heartbeat, making sure no trains or apparently one truck came by two blocks by and ruined all but one word was finished and it ruined it. So close to the feet. Talk about persistence. This guy worked on this. So um, Lord's pen, you know, Lord's prayer on a pen. This, by the time he was done, he was such a wreck. His eyesight, his body, he couldn't show it. So um, another guy <laughs> went and showed it. Well, the papers got it wrong. And the guy who went and showed it got the credit for his work for many years. And it's not really known back in those days, um, you know, early 1900s. It's it also across languages. It's hard to know if the guy actually took credit for it or if he just showed it and there was some lazy journalism that took place. But um, this was an amazing feat to his craft. His professionalism was at stake. He wanted to do something memorable. And he ended up injuring his health. Two other people are credited for his work. Was it worth it to this guy? He has one kid and a wife. I don't know. He did something amazing. It's never been done before, except there's two other pins that are just as impressive. So my question is, what is the value of going so fast? Is it really life changing? Is it really important? And is it really worth doing something so unsustainable? So it has to be worth it. Sometimes it is totally worth it. Was it worth me taking a Sawzall so my sister could go to sleep the night she moved? We didn't have any other options. It had to be done, yes. 
Uh, will I do? Will I ruin my grip strength on a normal day just because someone um, thought I should be faster for no reason and threw a pizza at me? No, I, I don't want to do that. So um, part of that thing, um, this is this is basically if you just remember one thing I talked about on small projects is the most important thing that there's no way to deliver a small project without more trust. You cannot cover your rear, write down in detail every single thing you did, make fancy pie charts, and still do work this fast. Something has to give. Don't let it be the important work. Let it be the silly stuff that does not impact anybody. And you know what that stuff is. You get asked to do it. Say, do you really want that? instead of what this customer needs. And also, it's about saying no. If the project doesn't say small, it's never going out. So um, I really think that there has to be trust. There has to be trust between the business people that are telling you the needs, the users who want something good, and the developers and testers that are trying to make that happen. And the better the trust is, the lower amount this type of extraneous work that does not impact the end product will be. I think the Agile Manifesto speaks directly to that, and it gets lost sometimes in the Agile process. Um, I sometimes will go read the Agile Manifesto if I have a hard day and I'll think to myself, what am I doing that serves that, and what am I doing that does not serve that? And do I need to change my approach? I mean, I went home from Wisconsin after saying never and realized I need to change my approach. I'm alienating people, and I need their trust, and they need to trust me. That's not going to work. So really, if we trust in our customers, and also if our customers and business people can trust us to deliver, then that relationship can build. And they're able to say, OK, maybe I don't need 14 pie charts and this by Saturday if I have what I really need consistently. And I know you're doing everything you can to get us there in a sustainable way. Um, also, just not burning people out is really important. We have to have things that are inspiring. OK, so what if you have lots of small projects? This is me. OK, these are Cheerios in a pillbox. Aren't they cute? I love those. I, I love little things. So you can tell like fennel boxes and stuff. I just love. And cat pictures, of course. So this is the ultimate cat dense photo you'll ever see in one of my slides. That is a lot of cats up a tree. So that's cats, cats everywhere, and not a leaf to be seen. So projects, when you have a lot of them, it can seem extremely overwhelming. This is the most depressing snowman ever. <laughs> and I'm sorry if it's shocking, but I saw it one day and just started cracking up because this is crazy. Um, I read a book last night. I have this Kindle book, and I put this on my Twitter, which my Twitter is like half work, half personal. I don't really separate the two. Like, I'm trying to be a good person in both. So, um, But LinkedIn for work only, but... Anyways, I read this book, and the main character, it's a fantasy book, says uh, he walked into the small cottage and casually tossed a cord of wood into the fireplace, and the small fire gently warmed the space. Well, if any of you, like me, had a stove and wood growing up, which here in Canada I'm sure many of you have, a cord of wood is four foot by four foot by eight feet. So for anyone to casually toss a cord of wood would be a heroic feat, to say the least. And the whole cottage would have burned down because it would be filled to the roof with wood. So thinking about that, I thought, well, the editor read it. Cord of wood is a valid measure. The spelling check passed. The grammar passed. The problem is no business context. This makes no sense at all. I mean, he's supposed to be having this nice moment, and I'm thinking he just burned down his whole cottage. <laughs> and it's silly. So um, 
that's a really good example of what Janet was talking about earlier, where the value is missing, the context is missing. Yeah, maybe we passed the unit test. Maybe, yeah, but it makes no sense. And we've now embarrassed ourselves and show we have no expertise. So um, there is a secret to feeling less overwhelmed when you have multiple projects. And this is my favorite quote. I've used it probably like five different times. And I just keep coming back to it. That all we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. So it's up to us as members of our quality team, our team making a quality product, hopefully, not just the quality team, but the whole team, to decide what the priorities are. I do not slice time in smaller than half a day. So if I have seven projects, maybe your update's gonna come on Tuesday morning, or maybe it's not gonna be till Thursday evening because it's not the top priority project, but I'm not gonna tell you that you can have them all on Monday night because I can't be productive that way. I just cannot. I, I know there's people that are smarter than I am and maybe they have a way to do it, but I have to work on a set of priorities and if I'm switching, I can do start something in the morning, go have lunch, come back and really focus and do great work for that evening, but I can't do seven projects in one day. Um, I have math, that's awesome. Now we have four, sometimes even five, because a developer might do one, updates in a day, that's pretty amazing. You know, we don't have to treat people poorly to get out multiple projects at a time. It's possible to do it in a way that's not destructive and in a way that has value, but not if one person is trying to do eight projects in one day, that's a horrible experience and it's unsustainable. So I guess what I'm trying to share with you is to protect your time. It's really precious. And if you're using it and you feel like you're part of something great, it's not draining, it's energizing and it's inspiring. And you feel like you are happy to be part of the team instead of really drained by it. So <laughs> I love this picture, partly because it reminds me of my crazed shelter cat. I have a really weird special needs cat and she bites her own tail when she's bored. So, I mean, I'm kind of like that. I need to always know what I'm doing next or I can get kind of wacky. So, what I love about this <laughs> picture is just the tongue, <laughs> the colorful tongue. So, um, you can enjoy multiple projects if you enjoy the variety of it. If you can see what's common about them, what's different about them, you can really enjoy the variety. And also, I love doing exploratory testing. It's what I value the most because honestly it's where I feel I'm talented. So if you have one area where you're really talented, like you make amazing um, baseline performance tests and when they run you feel great or maybe you're the person that you can come up with a way to diff two files and find out what's worth looking at or maybe you just use a tool to assist you and it's super clever. Whatever it is that gives you that boost that you're really good at, schedule that for when you need it to energize yourself. So I have my charters and I know on that project, now I use charter really loosely and I'm doing a workshop tomorrow and so um, I hope some of you are gonna come, it's gonna be cool. So it's about applying exploratory testing, but basically a charter is just a directive that guides a time box of testing. So, um, you know, it's a short blurb about what you're going to test around. But sometimes I'll also throw in cases that I want to be sure to cover because I've either agreed to it or it's something I got to get out of my head on the paper. Or I'm going to forget it. That's what brings me joy, though. So you have to find that one thing in testing that you love and make sure you insert that fun into your day or you're not going to be able to continue to do this testing. OK. Oh, dear. OK. I know, a lot of stories are told. Okay, I have one story to tell I've never told to a crowd of people before. Um, I went to a small conference about writers in software testing. And um, Elizabeth Hendrickson was there, and some people that I am friends with now, Lisa Crispin was there. And it was around the end of my time at Adobe. And I um, talked to Chris McMahon, 
there was one of the attendees and I said, you know, I just don't think testing's for me anymore. I, I just don't like what they're doing to it. You know, I don't want to make another pie chart. I don't want to write down another 15 minutes I spent on some stupid thing. This is just a waste. Why am I doing this? You know, I feel like I just keep working more and more and more and, you know, the people that are directing it know less and less and won't listen. I don't know why I'm doing it. And um, Chris said, it's not like that everywhere. You have no idea what testing's like anywhere else. You've been in the same company for 10 years. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? So I thought about that. I thought, what am I doing? Well, I've had four different jobs. I worked on a bunch of different teams. Okay, I've learned what I can learn here. I need to try something else. That's all it is. So if you're having a hard time with what you're testing, you might be in the wrong size company. You might be on the wrong team. You might have the wrong manager, or it may just be the time in your life where that job is a good fit is no longer a match. Um, it was really scary my last day of leaving work after working a whole decade at the same company, sort of like you know that route in your mind where you drive. I was unemployed for five days. It wasn't that terrifying of the five days. <laughs> and um, when I went, the first interview I went to, one of the questions I failed on is someone asked me who I would consult about my testing. And I'm lucky they followed up. They called me and they said, why didn't you mention talking to a business analyst? I said, well, I've never met one. So someone came in and said, hi, I'm John, I'm a business analyst. This is what I do for my work. And suddenly testing was interesting to me again. I had a different team of people. I'd just been in a team of testers that were not interacting with developers. They were not interacting with business people. There's such a ginormous world of testing that I've just begun for. Uh, it was a dream of mine to go to a place that never had a tester before and see if I could make testing a concept that would happen. And it's not perfect, but it's fun for me because I'm doing something new and I'm learning from it. So if testing isn't fun, there's a lot of testing out there that needs to be done, that needs people that are enthused about it. And, and if we get burnt out, we can't be our best and it's not serving anybody. So obstacles to small projects. This is my avoid painful PMS. These are problems you cannot let get in your way. Politics, precedence, and posturing. That is, well, it's not done that way. We've never done it that way. Well, I'm the boss here, and well, I'm the tester, and I'm in charge of quality. All those fall under the first one. They're all unimportant. Micromanaging meetings and metrics. The evil ends. Oh, we got to go in a meeting and talk about this five times, and those are taking away time from doing stuff. Status structure and silence so structure being oh i can't talk to that guy because uh, he's two levels above me and um you know it'd be embarrassing if i didn't know that and i had to go ask for his expertise it would just show that i'm weak in this area of security and that would just embarrass my team no we can't do that and then silence is the worst that's just making an assumption not asking not saying a word it's being blocked for a day and not saying anything, and then you go the next morning to your meeting and say, oh, I didn't do anything, any tests. Yeah, the service was down, and uh, I just couldn't really reach it. You know, that's, that's deadline and team destroying. So we want to get around these obstacles by courage and trust. That's it. It's that simple. Courage and trust, we have to have those. So if these obstacles get in the way, we're going to just persistently face them, respectfully face them, and realize these are difficult changes that take time, but they're worth, they're worth it. And uh, it may be painful. That's the picture. See? Perilous PMS. If someone's hurting, we're going to give them time to recover, and we're also going to be sensitive in this, not just force change on people beyond their ability to tolerate it. So that's another thing is... Um, using all of our senses to see, you know, is there something in this team, I'm going to push someone over the edge by mentioning this. Uh, we have to take care of the whole team and not just the project. Oh, when it must be small. <laughs> Sometimes on the really small projects, you just have to hold on. 
those are the times when it's abnormally cold weather. There's an abnormally strange situation. Like yesterday when I came into town, it poured down rain for 10 minutes. It got all the clothes on the top of my backpack wet, and I had to blow dry my pants because they were wet up to the knees. It only rained maybe like 15 minutes, but it happened to be when I was walking from the train station, which I thought was hilarious as a tester because I break ATMs and stuff all the time. I accidentally broke the machine on the SkyTrain by race condition. And it just, <laughs> so funny. Um, but So I know to expect this. Um, but I'm from Seattle, not a big deal. Oh, this guy, uh, I have his name written down. It's two W's, like Willard Wiggins or something. This guy, uh, Snow White, all the dwarves, evil witch, in the eye of a needle. You saw that universe one, that was pretty cool, right? No, he's upped his game. He's got Elvis on the head of a pin with the sequin jumpsuit and the microphone and all seven dwarves in the eye of a needle now. So he's uh, got to the point where he has fancy tools. Uh, I'm sure he looks real crazy coming out with these zoomed in eyes on the goggles and he does meditation breathing to get all that stuff going. Okay, so this is the main thing I've learned from Agile projects, to not despair, besides the time. So I ask, what can I test today so I'm ready for tomorrow? And that means if there's something shipping tomorrow, I better darn well test it today. But I try not to think in huge chunks. I can't think about the fact that this month I have four projects that go out. I need to think about it smaller because I'm going to get there as long as I do this, right? What am I going to test today to make sure it's there for me tomorrow? Just not, not complicated um, because if I'm not in a good place to do my testing, I'm not being effective. Okay, a few references. Uh, they have these slides too. I added a couple things, but, um, but they're going to be online. So the artist who did those pencil carvings I showed. The particular pin I showed is by A. Schiller, but you heard about two people who went blind and hurt themselves competing. We don't want to be those. We want to be the one person who did it first, did it best. And then uh, Willard Wiggin is the needle, needle microsculpture. And then uh, I heard a quote on Twitter yesterday that I just loved. It said, metrics are for fools, analytics are for everyone else. <laughs> I think that's a little harsh, but still funny. Um, so I think that people do bad things with data. Data is never evil. Data abuse is evil. Data itself is useful. You should not abuse data and do bad things with it. You should just use it nicely to help yourself and your team do better. Um, anyways, 44% cat density on the, the highest slide. And then 31% uh, of the animals shown were cats today, just so you know. In case anyone's keeping track. <laughs> all right, um, so that's all I brought to share with you guys, but I'm hoping that you have some questions, answers, or some amazing stories that you want to share that can uh, help. So anybody, questions about anything mentioned or want to share a story? Really tough crowd. <laughs> Anybody want to uh, say something kindly about metrics that you like since I kind of bashed them a little bit? Not really, not so much of it. Um, hmm. Yeah. That's generally the way we do them. We jumble them all up and then test them. Um, well, it appears that was unclear. Awesome. So the question was, I mentioned the top testing fixes in isolation versus all jumbled up together. And it, I wasn't clear at all because what we do is both. First, we test it in isolation. And then, only when it passes and we feel it's fixed without side effects, then we integrate it. And I'm able to make that build myself. We have Jenkins set up, so once I accept it, little script runs, I have my build, it's numbered so I know what's in it, I get my notes, I test it, and if it passes, 
then I run other tests around it, right? I'm not going to run all the regression on the small one with the fix because I can't test the interactions there. I'm only testing the fix and the area around it. I want to wait until I have all those fixes to run my regression test automation. Does that make more sense? Like, it's, it's just an extra check up front so we don't get bad fixes as often and we can find those issues before they're harder to isolate because it's the code that's already been tested we have a baseline for plus that tiny change. So it's like feeding a baby little bites instead of just like the fire hose approach. Um, uh, you know, eventually the customers get the fire hose. <laughs> that was a terrible analogy or metaphor, sorry about that. Oh dear. Yeah, eventually we do have to test everything together. It's a really good point. It can't be avoided because uh, we got integration issues. If we have environmental problems, we could have regressions. So yeah, we aren't avoiding it. We're just preventing a lot of backtracking and isolation with bad fixes. Um, and it's also, we have this new way we just did in the last year, where from our test environment, we can go back to any build we want. So I can isolate where issues were introduced and that way I can really, if it's important, I can in the morning have someone in a different time zone start fixing something before they otherwise would have. So that's another use for that. Um, does anyone else have other experiences with testing isolated fixes that they could share? Not really? Okay, cool. Thank you very much. That was a great question.